the title of this session is Lasting Images and Memories, and we have Sarah Seeger uh, coming to talk to us about remembering my canoeing with Mike Weberick. Uh, Sarah and Mike, in years past, actually, have made presentations here before. So, Sarah. Well, it's great to be here. It's great to be back in Canada. Yeah, it's great to see uh, all of you who I haven't seen in about a decade. We're here to remember Mike Webrick. He was my canoe partner, my husband. And I actually met him in the WCA. And that's why I'm here, to tell you the story of our life together. This picture is Mike on the Des Moines. All the pictures are ones that either I took or he took. And just for the old school person, the only one who did the slides, I just got myself a slide scanner for this talk. It's fun. <laughs> okay, so start with a couple of pictures of Mike. Mike was a phenomenal whitewater paddler. He paddled in the Grand Canyon. He stayed upright through pretty much every single rapid, including Lava Falls. He's paddled all over the Northeast, out through West Virginia. He was also a skilled wilderness stripper. So Mike died of cancer last summer after a one and a half year battle. So thanks for coming. Thanks for coming here to listen to my story. I've been really thrilled with how the paddling community has responded, and in fact, just a couple of days ago I got an email, and at the end of the email it said, my heart goes with you, know that all of us in the canoeing community share your grief, from Cliff Jacobson. And I was impressed with how many people responded, who most of them have seen me or Mike either give talks, or you've seen us on the river in the Northeast, or you saw us here at the WCA many years ago. But I was so thrilled with how many people supported me by writing to me, and examples inviting me here, who didn't even really know us that well. So thank you for acknowledging that one of your own has died. Well, the story begins right here in this very room. 18 years ago, I was 22 years old. I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto, completing my math and physics degree. In fact, I see one of my professors right here in the audience. <laughs> By the way, he gave me a C on an oral exam. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, don't worry, because I'm now professor of physics at MIT, so it's okay. <laughs> right. so, uh, I don't know how I came to this symposium. I only know someone told me about George, who is not my physics professor. Apparently, he called students at home when their homework was late, so it was probably a good thing. He wasn't mine. But George was there as a resource for me, and somehow I find out about him. I came to this, this presentation, and I was finishing my undergraduate degree. I knew I was headed to grad school. So I thought, this is my summer, my chance to do a huge canoe trip, because I'm not accountable. I don't have a job, grad student school will pay me a stipend. I can go and do something big. What should I do? So I come to the symposium, and someone who knew my family, who I haven't seen before or since, approached me and said, read these two books. They will change your life. One of the books, this is serious. I know it sounds funny, but it's, it's a true story. One of the books was Journey to a Copper Mine by Samuel Hearn, which was a bit dry. The other book was this book here, Sleeping Island, by P.G. Downs. Well, I read P Sleeping Island, and I fell in love with this book. The writing is phenomenal. I thought, I'm doing some of this trip, some of the, what he describes. I'm going to go start in northern Saskatchewan, the boreal forest. I'm going to do the Old North Trail. I'm going to go see the Barren Lands. This is going to be my big summer trip. I'm going to go for two months. It's pretty hard, by the way, to go north and end at the end of August, start when the ice breaks, go to the end of August because of the weather. I was excited about the trip. I went to the, we didn't have really internet in those days, but went to Robart's library. They had all the maps. And the one thing missing actually was I didn't have a canoe partner. I wasn't into the group thing. I mean, I admire the group thing, but it's just not me as a person. I can't really get along that well with people. <laughs> Some people in this audience will, will know. So what happened? In parallel, I had joined the WCA and I was going on a ski trip. And I called the, or the organizer of the trip up in Sudbury, Richard Culpepper. And I said, is there anyone who can carpool? This was a Friday morning around 10. And he said, here's a couple people I called. One was Mike at work. I'd never met him. And I'm like, okay, we're going to carpool. Okay, we'll carpool. So he met me and we carpooled. We went on a ski trip. He was impressed with my skiing. This was a backcountry trip. There were no trails, but it was quite steep, rocky. And after that trip, he kept calling me to do stuff. He'd say, Sarah, do you want to go skiing? And I'd say, well, no thanks, I have my own ski group. Because, you know, I wasn't that impressed with the skiing. <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny, he used to claim it was the equipment, you know, the people who do backcountry skiing, but whatever. So then he'd call again and say, well, do you want to go hiking? I was like, no, I don't really like hiking. 
And you say, well, do you want to go on a trip to the White Mountains sometime? No, no I'm going to be going to grad school near that area. I don't, I don't want to go there. So you kept calling. Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? I was like, no, no, no thanks. So one day, well, you kind of know where the story's going, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But one day, he calls and goes, Sarah, the ice broke. Do you want to go paddling on a local river? Yes. So we started paddling together. Although that first time we went on the trip, we flipped, actually. We were fooling around in a dam. But nonetheless, we started paddling all summer. And when he learned about my trip that I was planning, he said he wanted to go with me. So needless to say, I can't summarize the whole thing, how we didn't really know each other all that well. The two of us went together on this trip, which I'm now going to tell you about. In the meantime, thankfully, George was around, and he was my own personal mentor. He invited me to his house. He lent me his very, very rare books. He told me he helped Mike build, make, he gave us his plans for the spray cover that Mike made for our old, his Mike's Old Town Tripper. And thanks, George. It's great to have you be a, a supporter. Okay, so we're going to get back to this now. So here's the trip. We started, uh, we drove four and a half days to where the road ends in northern Saskatchewan at Wollaston Lake. And the trip, this is a, something that Tony Harding had made when I wrote the article for Nostalgia. So here is Wollaston Lake in northern Saskatchewan. You can see Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Northwest Territories. Start at Wollaston Lake, go up here through this famous Old North Trail. And this was one of the routes that not only PG Downs took, but that the natives and other people took to go back and forth. Up here, here's Casbah Lake. We heard about part of the Kazan here. What was different about our trip was, by the way, it pays, um, it pays in science, actually, to be naive and not know how hard things are in advance. And the same may or may not have been true here. We went here, and you know, having time but no money, because we didn't imagine paddling all the way to Baker Lake and ending at the end of August, which is pretty cold and windy. Decided, I decided the trip I would go back up this way through here. You see, there's not really anything here. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about briefly about this trip. I can't tell you about the whole trip because that would take way too long. So it was a big trip. We started in Wollaston Lake, a bigger lake, two, it's 2,000 square kilometers. The biggest lake I knew would fit in a small bay of Wollaston Lake. This lake was huge, and for new people who had never been this far north, it was amazing. We felt like the whole trip, the whole summer, just extended endlessly before us. One thing that happened on this trip was right away, we saw a lot of things we'd never seen before. And one of them was this. Every afternoon, the sky was filled with smoke. And in the morning, we would see more localized things like this. And by the way, um, I was very studious. And I had come to George often, I don't know if he remembers, with like a list of things to go over. And one of the things was on the list was, George, uh, you know, if I get see a forest fire, what's your advice for me here? You know, because at the time, I thought professors knew everything. Now that I'm a professor, I know that's not true. <laughs> but I was like, and George actually, unfortunately, he didn't answer that one, and I let that one go. I should have pressed him on it. He's like, Sarah, well, if you're ever on a portage, you just want to make sure there's no fire at one end and the other end, and you're stuck in the middle. <laughs> that was George's advice to me. So we went on this trip. A lot happened on the trip. We went up the Little Lakes, and there was one small point where I was actually irked with P.G. Downs. I'd studied his book so carefully, and when I was picking up the book to review for this talk, I found a little note I'd written to myself. And I said, uh, he, his writing was so great. I have seen these beautiful little lakes, some of the most beautiful country I've ever seen. Some of it was burning as we passed. Other parts had ravaged in a massive fire three years ago, but the old trails were still there. The part where I got irked, I said, I found P.G. Downs to exaggerate greatly. Where he talks of a long and violent rapid, in quotes, it was actually a picturesque and straightforward run. Where he mentions an arduous portage through a bog, it's actually flat and easy around the bog. He's an excellent writer, I'm sure you'll agree, but I found him to exaggerate. Now later, of course, I learned that wasn't actually what happened. We just had really low water that year. But here we are paddling through the beautiful little lakes. See that little fire in the corner there? If anyone has been to the little lakes between when I went, which was 1994 and today, I'd love to hear what you saw there. Because that summer there was low water, the fires were rampant. So the fires are everywhere. Here we are, hiking. here's Mike hiking up, uh, we're traveling now up the Little Partridge River. And I have to skip over some details. If you've been here, you'll know what I'm talking about. If not, just know we're going up a watershed. We're gonna hike over the kayak, hike, hike. we're gonna canoe, uh, kayak, canoe portage over the height of land into Casbah Lake. And then we're gonna go down the part of the Kazan. So here we are hiking up. Here's a picture. So you can't even go down that river. You can tell where the water should be, where all those rocks are. We're a little worried here because it looked like we we're gonna be hiking all the way from here to Casbah Lake, which was probably still you know, 50 kilometers away. If you look carefully in the top there, you'll see this hill. I believe that's Roosevelt Hill, so we're heading up here to the hill over to Casbah Lake over there. So the fires were there, and 
Mike was always an optimist. You have to be, actually, if you have cancer. But he was always an optimist even before then. So we came to paddle up the little partridge, and you can see the water slow. There's fires everywhere. And all of a sudden, it was like someone had dropped a wall in front of me. I actually couldn't see anything. Could not see in front of me. It took a while for my brain to realize what was happening. What was happening? There was a fire, like, right there. And Mike, always the optimist, just said, I don't think we're in any real danger. <laughs> then, boom. The fire completely exploded and roared, and it was it's so loud, like you can't appreciate from a picture, burning so loud, and it looks far away, but the haze, it makes what we call um, optically thick, it makes it hard, it makes distances appear to be wider than they are. That's just right across the river from us. So that night, we took everything, put it up on the esker, figuring that esker couldn't burn, and I was worried. I mean, this was, we just started the trip, this was, well, three weeks into the trip. It was a 60-day trip, trip about nine weeks. And I was like, this is kind of a problem here. We had our EPIRP, that was the emergency locator before there were satellite cell phones, but it wouldn't help to set it off. And, and in retrospect, I don't really know how much danger we were really in. I do know many times we had tried to paddle through narrow channels where a fire was on one corner and we couldn't make it through. The smoke was so, I will say, deathly. So here we were on the trip and it was an interesting thing to have on your first big trip up north with your new canoe partner because you know, it gave me a chance to evaluate. <laughs> uh, I was trying to think, you know, it's hard to kind of get a lifetime of memories all in one spot. I was like, you know, what's going on in this trip? Should I behave differently? Should we do something different? Should we, whatever, whatever. So it's a good chance to reevaluate. And we did, and we moved on. And I remembered all those forest fires. Every morning they were localized. So at night I dreamed vividly of our getaway. And we woke up in the morning, we packed so fast you would not believe. Packed all our stuff up, hiked up. There we are on the hill that you saw before. That's why he's looking so exhausted. <laughs> and you can see back in the distance. Um, this is all actually not clouds, this is all from the forest fire back there. So here we are up on the hill, pretty tired out, but certainly having one of the biggest adventures we ever had in our life. Now on this trip, we did reach the Barren Lands. I'm not going to talk about the Kazan because it's written in the saga recently and people have already talked about it briefly, but we got to the Barren Lands. We did all those great things and for us it was a real time of exploration and adventure. Here I am with my first fish ever in my life. The fish were awesome up there. We only had a $5 fishing rod that we used to troll. So now I'm going to say a few words just about the other, the next part of the trip, uh, which, okay? So here's what I talked about. We went to the Old North Trail. We went up here where we had the forest fires down into Caswell Lake. By now we're down here, about halfway through the trip. Now we're going to hike back up. And on this trip, I just have to summarize by saying it has three words we don't normally like to associate with new trips. Upstream, rocks, and wind. And that basically summarizes the trip for you right now. Now, this was even rockier than your photos. I didn't try to like have a more extreme version of, of the other talks, but I thought about what I could talk about that some people here might not have seen. And so here you can see it's so rocky on the ground even, sometimes there wasn't even a place to put your foot. Like, those rocks were so exposed on the ground itself. Here Mike is looking dirtier and dirtier as the 60 days progress. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about briefly to finish this part of the this trip was Back here, so people have been down the Nolai, we went up the Nolai, we went across here, down to this area here, which normally you'd never go to, because no one does lake tripping up in that area. Usually you want to go down a big river. But this was some of the prettiest and most beautiful landscape I've seen in my entire life. And if I had to make my list of things to do, that's what happens when you're terminal ill, you have the list of things to do, I would go back here. Look how gorgeous it is. The eskers were unbelievable. They were just so beautiful. You can see the esker here. Here's Mike towing the canoe. And we had phenomenally beautiful eskers. Some of them were double and triple ridge. One time we got to camp inside an esker, there were like four walls, like a little cabin. And in between the ridges, there were these valleys filled with trees and it was really beautiful. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is me here carrying the canoe. And I really liked what the women said before. I never could flip the canoe. That was always my goal. Didn't meet that goal. But I could still always carry that old town tripper. Although my days of carrying the old town tripper are over now. <laughs> Okay, so that's that part of the trip, the forest fire ravage. You can read more about this back in the old Nostoggins, which are now all scanned and online. We called the trip 60 Days in the Land of the Little Sticks. Now, I wish I could tell you about all my trips with Mike. I've put some of them here. I was trying to make this map, and I realized I couldn't even remember all the trips we've done. We had about a decade of, of these canoe trips. But I would want to tell, I will tell you briefly about one more of the trips that was my favorite trip. And this trip was on the Swampy Bay River. Here's rivers of the Angava region. It's actually kind of hard to see, so let me go back to this previous slide. Up in this area, we paddled, uh, I guess, out this way here. Now, why this trip is so good, here, here we are looking clean and happy and young and healthy. That's our dog tucked in. And what was so great about this trip was, it, the scenery was constantly changing. It was an extremely challenging trip. 
But everywhere there was a bend in the river, there was big rapids or something interesting. And here you can see this interesting rock formation. Now on this trip, what was new for us was we took a new canoe, a pack canoe, which I guess now is quite popular, but at the time, this was one of the, I believe, newer versions. Now we hadn't had time to test the boat, so this is kind of a bad thing. You really want to know what your equipment, how your equipment behaves when you go up north. But I want you to look at the sequence of pictures I took. Look how the boat is flexing. It's supposed to flex. It just means that if you're used to the hard shell boat, you have to actually have a different set of skills. And that includes portaging, by the way, because the boat twists a lot while you're trying to carry it. So there he is. He's looking at me. You can tell that wasn't really a hard rapid. Comes relevant a little bit later in the talk. This trip had spectacular scenery. This is the swampy bay going down into the Kenya Piscow, which we heard about in out Coxack to Fujuac. We had some awesomely spectacular scenery on this trip. Most of the river didn't look this way. This was a particularly great stretch. There's me with, with Tuktu. But what I wanted to tell you about briefly were the waterfalls. There were so many waterfalls on this trip. And I, what I love about the north is how rivers, like think of the George River and this river, the Swampy Bay, although they're parallel to each other, they're absolutely completely different rivers. We had some gorgeous waterfalls. Here's my dog Tuktu right near a big drop. Tuktu, don't go, go too close to the edge. And she often got tired because there was a lot of portaging, even too much for a dog who wasn't carrying anything. She would wait by the gear. She knew we would always return to that gear. <laughs> so the one story I want to reminisce about on this trip, oh, there's lots of falls, and just speaking to one of the previous talks, Mike and I also carried emergency gear, like we had something strapped to our waist that contained you know, like a fire starter kit, some high density food, etc., etc. And unfortunately, I left Mike's on this particular spot, right here on the spot, portaging around this waterfall. There are lots of spectacular falls. The problem often was, right before the falls, look at that type of rapid. So you had a choice, okay? You could paddle on that rapid, and every day was cold and rainy and 50 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Or you could portage, but this is what you had to portage through. So what, what are you gonna do here? You gonna portage, or are you going to go in the rapids? Well, for me, I didn't mind portaging, I'm kind of conservative. I also don't like getting wet, <laughs> so uh, I guess I would portage, but we really couldn't decide, we became complacent. We, did, we weren't worried about, we, we became complacent if there was a falls, we kind of would argue like, how far close to the falls do we go? But we had this uh, rapid, this is actually a rapid I'm going to talk about now, where we were very complacent, it was a long rapid. It doesn't look that bad, but actually, you know, it's about waist deep here. It's about waist deep in this water. And we were scouting this from far away. I actually used binoculars to scout. That's how complacent we were. Who scouts with binoculars? It's a bad idea. I saw this line of white, but I really wasn't thinking, because, you know, when you go on these trips, after a few weeks, you just sort of, this was a one-month trip, you just kind of get relaxed and aren't really too on edge. So we go in this rapid, but the way the boat was set up at this particular time, Mike was in the front, I was in the back. We did that for tricky rapids because he was a much better paddler than me. He had better eyesight, he had better reflexes. So I would go in the back and sort of do, follow whatever he was doing in the front. But because of the canoe, the pack canoe, he started swamping. Okay, he went in between one of these, the drop was a little bigger than expected, he was a little heavier than we remembered, and water started filling, but I didn't know we were swamping because the boat started filling in the front, and because it was not a hard shell boat, it was soft, you know, the front started filling up. And he looked back at me, and I thought something was really wrong because of the way he looked at me, and I wasn't sure what was going on. We ended up completely swamping. Now, normally, you wouldn't have a problem with that. You swamp, you get out of the boat. That's how I know the rapid is way steep. <laughs> and you just sort of guide the boat to shore. The problem was, this boat got damaged really easily. And I don't, I say I support pack boats. They allowed us to go to really remote places. But the problem is, unlike the beautiful story we heard about the birch bark canoe, we don't have the materials in the forest to repair our boat. So we had brought the repair kit, and on, we had bought the boat on the way out, and we had tested it a little. But the salesperson, who's a very young man, assured us that no matter what happened, we could always put the boat back together and make it to the end. But I wasn't sure if he was saying that from experience or not. So we did have a kit. We had to guide the boat very, very carefully here. The dog was barking. I picked her up by the handle of her life jacket. I put her on a rock. I knew she could swim in rapids. She was pretty upset with me. She swam to shore. We got to shore. There, were, there was some damage on the, on, the, on the boat, but it wasn't too bad. But it was certainly a wake-up call about being complacent, something I won't, I won't forget about. Uh, there we are, getting ready to do other stuff. It had a bit of a bad effect on me. I was actually supposed to be completing my PhD, uh, and I, I, I had to go on the trip because, you know, summer doesn't wait for you. I couldn't finish the trip and then finish the PhD and then do the trip in September. It was way too cold for that. So I decided if I can't go now, I'll never go. If I can't do this while I'm a student, I'll never go. When I got back, I ended up having to pull a lot of all-nighters to make up for it, but we're on this trip. And then I started getting really anxious. I, I didn't feel anxious about the rapid, but I just couldn't paddle the rapid anymore. And I was like, well, it's 50 degrees, it's raining, I don't want to have a problem again. 
So we sort of went down. After a while, Mike just said, look, I can't solo the canoe fully loaded. I'm soloing the boat. If you want a portage, you're carrying all the gear. <laughs> so I went in the rapids and everything was fine for me today. <laughs> Here's, uh, we got along really well, by the way, we know, just in case. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, I thought you'd like to see this. We paddled, this one we did paddle right up to the waterfall. You can tell there's a big volume here. We're now in the canyon of Pisco. I think some of you will recognize this waterfall. Yeah, it was beautiful there. It was a very tiring trip. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to move on to, oh, so you can read about, it's called Swamping on the Swampy Bay River in the book Up the Creek by Doug McCann, which is full of stories from a lot of people in this room about what you shouldn't be doing. All right, now I'm coming to part two, which is when our big trips in the north stopped. We started a new adventure of our life with our first child, Max. Max went on his first canoe trip at age two and a half months. He did a week in Tamagami. I thought when I was on this trip, I was such a great mother because the kid was great. He behaved, he, did, he slept all night. He, uh, you know, it was a great trip. He was very calm. There's Mike, there's the dog tucked to. And by this time we were ignoring the dog because now we have baby. But somehow she appeared in every photo. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad she was he's hanging out with us. So we went with the kid. We had a great trip. We did a couple of trips with him before his brother appeared. His brother came on nice. And uh, we did actually a trip with friends who are here, Pete and Tracy Sorrell. We went on a trip. That trip is um, a whole other story into itself. And after the second one was born, I realized it wasn't me who was a great mother, it was the kid who was a great kid. Because the second kid needed to be held all the time. He was a baby. So I couldn't really canoe and like do stuff with the other kid attached to my arm. So if anyone wants advice about how to go up north with two little kids who are still in diapers, I can give you some advice, actually. My advice is, don't do it. <laughs> so I waited. I Unfortunately, I had to stop canoeing. I didn't go in a tent. I didn't go on a trip for like two or three years. I vowed I wouldn't go back until the kids were old enough that they didn't need diapers and they could dress themselves. And that year finally came. So now it's very sad for me to go through these, but I thought you'd like to see them. There's the baby. He got big. <laughs> Should he go in? He's never jumped before. He can't really swim, actually, at this point. But he's got the life jacket on. <laughs> Look at his dad. His dad's waiting for him. Yes, that was fun. <laughs> and in um, reviewing these slides to come here, I showed them to the kids. I said, look, do you want to start canoeing again? Here, here's how great it was. And they, they liked it. They're like, of course we want to go. They forgot how they whined like, for half the trip. <laughs> I forgot too, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I put this little collage together to just say how we finally figured out how to canoe with kids. Here we are in the boat. There's Mike in the back. We put Max, the older child, with him. I would sit here. The little one who caused trouble goes in the front. <laughs> you can't flip it out. Got all our stuff here. Here they are by the fire. In the tent, you can see how the kids uh, resemble their dad. There's a happy photo of everybody. And here they are fooling around on the log. And I have to say, at this point, I feel like, you know, ripped off because we were finally getting our life back together. Those people who love doing things where kids can't be included, you can finally start doing them again. So unfortunately, he's not here now. I have to move on without him. And here are the kids. If there's such a thing as a paddling gene, they have inherited it. And I'm not even saying that jokingly. Like for me, it was very hard to learn whitewater. I just don't have that 3D spatial thing going. The kids got it. They hardly have ever canoed. They go in the kayak and taking them in the fall. And of course, they decided they wanted to learn how to kayak. When fall appeared, you can see the deciduous trees have lost their leaves. The water here is 50 degrees. That's like 8 degrees Celsius. So fine, they want to learn. They go in their kayaks. Which, by the way, Mike had bought them long before they were ready to kayak. <laughs> you know, kids must have a kayak. That made 15 boats for us by the time we got these two little boats. Kids like fooling around. You know, they don't do what we would do. If you were going to learn how to kayak, you'd probably take a class and do a few strokes. They start fooling around, and the older kid flips in the water in the 8 degrees Celsius water. I was right with him because, you know, I know that something could happen. And he was fooling around on a deadfall. He claimed that he would have either banged his head or he had to flip. So I'm here, Max, uh, there's no emergency, and I'm trying to think of how am I going to get him back in his boat without me having to go into the cold water. And before I know it, the kid, eight years old, flips his boat and gets back in it. So the kids like the outdoors, and uh, that's, I think that would be a great thing for me in the end. The other child, a little more impatient. First, the first day, he zooms around, he loves it. The next day, we're on a river. The next time he went out, he's like, this is boring. I want current. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to have to beef up my skills here so I can, can take them. Because Mike was really such a great paddler. He would rescue people. He went in big waves. I've got to beef up my skills so I can teach these two how to paddle. Here's a picture of Mike and I near our house. We live near the Concord River on the Old North. It's near, this is the Old North Bridge, a very uh, famous place. And I, I really 
it's really hard for me to communicate everything that has happened, but to make a really long, sad story short, I'll just say the best analogy I can think of is like when the dinosaurs got extinct from a huge meteor. And if you think of the Chuck Crater story, whatever killed the dinosaurs was a lot bigger. So that is really terrible, right? The dinosaurs killed my life was a wreck. But after those dinosaurs died, new things could flourish. And so the last part of my talk, I was hoping to tell you about some new things that are flourishing. There's nothing I can do that Mike's not here, uh, but there's this phrase, it is as it is, and try to move on. So I moved to part three of the talk. This is, I've just got a few more slides to tell you about some things that are going on that actually might not have happened. Does this look like the Barren Lands to you? <laughs> kind of does. This is actually in, in New Hampshire. And what's really cool about hiking in New Hampshire is you can hike up and you can get past the tree line quickly. You don't need to go north and you know, take all that time to get up there and then canoe forever and get cold and wet. You actually can go through the tree line in this. And so on our last summer together, I forgot to mention something. Um, Mike still looks pretty good there. He's on chemotherapy at this point. It's August, it's like summer 2010. He just, he looks so great because he took a week off chemo. He took three weeks to go out to the salmon. It's the North Fork of the Salmon running a commercial trip. He got back, we had one great day together before he started chemo again. And this summer I really wanted to go on a canoe trip. I thought maybe it would be our, our last one. And he really didn't want to go because chemo had really worn him out. And that's different. He could still go to the salmon, right? He felt like he couldn't do that canoe trip in Tomogamy because you know how much effort it takes to take kids up there? Like you're constantly having to do everything. So he really didn't want to. And on one hand, I just, I couldn't push him on it because I was trying to be positive that we would have another chance. But at the same time, I really wanted to go. And so part of the story about flourishing is what happens when you can't do the things you really wanted to do. Well, instead, our really lame vacation was, this part's supposed to be funny, so I, I hope you'll, you'll laugh. We went to New Hampshire and we stayed indoors and like rented an apartment and we drove up Mount Washington. Okay, so I think you'd get by now someone like me, like driving at Mount Washington. That's, that's ridiculous. So drive at Mount Washington because the best Mike can do for his, you know, condition. And one of the kids, five years old, just fell in love with the mountains. And he told me, he was five years old, I'm going to hike up Mount Washington when I'm six and set a world record. He's like, okay, we'll go up Mount Washington and we'll set a world record. And then the next year I found out you can't really set a world record at that because four-year-olds have hiked up. It's not necessarily easy. It's a 6,000 feet. You do 4,000 feet of hiking. The shortest trail up is 1,000 foot per mile for four miles. But nonetheless, he had this goal he had on to, and I wanted to help him support his goal. Now, I know my view before I started this with the kid was, why hike? Who would want to do an all-day portage? It makes no sense. <laughs> I mean, why would you want to do this? I just I couldn't understand this. And Mike and I, we never hike. Like, we just didn't really hike together as a couple. It wasn't something we did. So the next summer, you know, we go back, and we were kind of housebound for the summer, but after Mike was no longer alive, we could be free, and we started doing things again. And I'm just trying to put us all in this position of where the kid might have been. I mean, I don't know where his mind was, but it's very hard to be five turning six, because you're sort of self-centered, but then you start seeing the world around you. And the world he saw was not a good world. He saw his dad was sick and grouchy. Our family was a mess. But he had this goal. He wanted to hike up Mount Washington. It was a dream. He thought he could do it. So I took him there. We waited for a great day. And before I continue this story, I just want to show you that the other child, because you know, you're supposed to treat your kids equally, the other one, we have something else going on, but it's not related to the outdoors. This particular one, I took him there, and we found a great day. We hike up the mountain. He's all business, six years old. You know, He's just going up. He won't even stop for a break. And the problem is he's uh, six. I'm actually 40 now, 40, 40 years old. When you're six, you're getting bigger and stronger every year. When you're 40, well, you know. So I couldn't close the gap, because I had to carry everything. And as soon as he would you know, get ahead, it was harder to close the gap. So there he is. Um, he, you can see we're almost at the top here. He knows he's going to make his dream. He knows he's going to make it to the top. We could see forever. We chose a great day so we wouldn't have a problem because despite this looking like a walk in the park, people can die on this mountain any single day of the year. It creates its own weather system and weather rolls in and it can actually uh, snow or rain and people end up just getting lost up there. So we made sure we had a good day so we wouldn't have to worry about the weather. We get up there, and the kid looks around. Remember where he's coming from. This is his goal. He's wanted to do this for a year. It's a lot for a little kid. It's a lot for a lot of adults. And he looks around, paused, and said, live your dreams. <laughs> yeah. And then he thought a little longer, and he said, live your dreams, face your fears, and pay attention to your surroundings. That's my philosophy. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, where does he get this from? <laughs> We got to the top, and it was still early in the day, but at this point, I wanted to try to be inspiring to you, but when I was thinking this over, I just realized why I love this group, why I love being a part of this community, because most people don't live their dreams. 
And the great thing about all of you is you do. I was just sat through all these great talks. You wrote a book. You raised money for kids. You went up to that really northern part of Quebec where no one really goes. You actually have done all these great things. And I remember now being a part of this community when I first started here and did the big trips. And we're all living our dreams. And it's great to be a part, a part of this group. But that's how I live my life now. I try to support people and my students and mentees and all the people around me to live their dreams. So when I told the kids, since you blasted up this mountain like it was nothing, I said, you know, I told my kids, we're going to go to Hawaii. I didn't tell them why, because I was avoiding the holidays for grief. We're going to go to Hawaii at Christmas. That was this past Christmas. And I told the kid, um, by the way, we're going to go to Maui, because there's a 10,000 foot mountain, just in case you feel like you want to hike it. That's all. I didn't say I wanted to hike it. Remember, I told you, hiking's like a portage. Why would I want to hike? So just mentioned it to him. So of course, he's walking around going, I'm going to hike Haleakala. That's the dormant volcano. I'm going to hike Haleakala. So I hired a guide, because you know, it's one thing if me and Mike want to risk our lives doing stuff we have no idea. feels kind of like we didn't always know what we were doing, but I can't risk my kid's life at 10,000 feet hiking in a situation where I don't know how he's going to handle it. So I got a guy, because the kid is 50 pounds, so if anything went wrong, he could be carried. He just he tired. <laughs> but it's not really um, for, it's not for the faint at heart. This trip, it's a one-day trip. And by the way, he only hikes up, he doesn't hike down, because he's got small legs. <laughs> so 18 miles. 10,000 feet, that's 3,000 meters altitude gain, single day, six years old, 18 miles. So we go on this trip, and it was pretty tiring. But here he is in the crater. So we start in the lush valley of Hawaii, we hike up, beautiful vista, come to the crater, and it's 7,000 feet in the first seven miles. And then the crater, you slowly, just like, well, like I said, when you get altitude, it's like going north, everything falls away, and here we are in the beautiful crater. Well, we hiked up that mountain, and towards the top, I just, he was very tired, and it got to the point, you know how that you're on port, you know if you're on these long trips and you sort of burn yourself out? And then even if you rest, you can't recover. And sometimes when you go to sleep, even the next day, after the first portage, it might have been like you just portaged for 30 days in a row. That's how he was feeling when he was getting to the top. And I said, look, Alex, you know, you can be carried the rest of the way. That's why we brought Dylan, just for that reason. But you won't feel like you've made it to the top. But I don't mind, you know, if you really need to be carried, you can. The part I didn't tell him was I wasn't paying thousands of dollars to bring him back to Hawaii to try another time. So he decided on his own that he was going to make it to the top. And we did make it to the top. We took longer than we expected, 13 hours. We made it to the top and on a beautiful, spectacular night sky. So that's the legacy of Mike. It is uh, living on through his children, the one child who inherited his calm nature, the one who flipped the boat and knew how to get back in without anyone telling him. The other child who inherited Mike's insane fitness level and my ambition is hiking. So I'm thinking now, you might not see me again, because I have to join a group, if there is one, called the WHA, Wilderness Hiking Association. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. So to conclude my talk, I just want to tell you that because Mike and I met in the WCA, and it was central to our life together initially, figured for us to figure out how to go north, and it gave us a place to, to learn how to go north, and it's the place where we met, we have established the annual Mike Weverick Memorial Presentation. This is going to happen every year at the WC Wine and Cheese Fall Gathering, whereas some of you who have been there know there's one featured speaker every year. The first presentation will be this November. So I will see you in November. Thank you.